Hi everyone, welcome to our talk, Anomaly Detection at the Edge. This is Arun Kejriwal with my colleague Ira Kohan. Uh, we have known each other for several years. We have worked in the space of anomaly detection uh, in different capacities. I've, in my previous life, uh, I've worked on anomaly de uh, detection in the context of marketing, in the context of infrastructure. Um, on the other hand, Ira co-founded a company called Anodot. Uh, which has built a great product around this topic. He will talk a more about uh, the company and the product, the customers uh, later in the talk. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel to reach out to us uh, via Twitter. Our Twitter handles are there on the slide deck. Uh, in general, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions after the talk via, the, uh, via chat. Uh, we'll be more than happy to uh, answer any questions. Uh, without uh, any further uh, ado, let's uh, uh, dive st straight in. Cloud computing has enabled scale, innovation, connection over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, going forward, uh, edge computing uh, is supposed to be the next big thing where it will complement cloud computing by providing more real-time value, more immersive experiences via more data production and intelligence uh, at the front end, you know, where the people are, where the things are. Uh, in fact, IDC forecasts that there'll be a, around 46 billion devices generating around 80 zettabytes of data in the next five years. Now you may wonder that what will make edge computing successful? So there are new technologies like 5G, which are uh, coming up uh, uh, very soon on the application side, Internet of Things, uh, which comprises broadly speaking of sensors and actuators uh, is ramping up uh, pretty fast. Now, as we all know that during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we were all stuck in our homes. So, and what if, if there is a network outage or there is a machine downtime? In such scenarios, it's critical to be able to still provide value to the customer. So hence, uh, in such scenarios, edge computing uh, plays a very vital role. Now, uh, uh, Spark Summit is a uh, industry centered uh, forum. So one may uh, wonder what is the business opportunity behind edge computing? So by certain estimates from Gartner and McKinsey, uh, it is expected to, to have a market share of around 9 billion in the next four years. And from a use case perspective, there are plenty of them like real-time automated decision-making and the criticality of edge computing stems from the fact that we need to be able to extract insights at the edge uh, owing to my uh, increasing data volume. And I'm going to talk uh, talk more about it in the subsequent slides. And, and of course, uh, there is an element of efficiency because uh, as much as insights may be helpful, but cost is also a uh, very practical matter. So on the, uh, so broadly speaking, there are four driving factors uh, uh, guiding the growth of edge computing. One is how do we minimize the latency behind uh, insight extraction? Then how do we address the data growth and the bandwidth limitations? And as I already mentioned, uh, 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 that the system should work you know, e even in the presence of um, uh, connection issues. What if there's a machine failure? And last but not the least, that how do we guarantee or provide a high level of privacy and security to the end customer? So broadly speaking, uh, there are several uh, aspects associated with uh, edge computing. Uh, one is on the compute side. As the data volume grows, uh, it's not uh, tenable to keep growing the data centers um, uh, because they are very power hungry and it's very expensive. So uh, over the last few years, federated learning has emerged as a very promising 
paradigm where you know, the competition is done uh, on the edge itself. Uh, now to make it possible, uh, we need high density, ultra low uh, read write latency on the devices itself because the data volume keeps increasing. As you can imagine that uh, um, video consumption uh, is on a steep rise. Now, if, if one were to provide video analytics on the edge, this will definitely require high density storage. Uh, uh, moving on, uh, as I mentioned, as I briefly talked about earlier, data security is also a critical challenge. Now in the context of edge devices, given their limited compute capability, the challenge is that how do we provide advanced authentication and encryption support uh, given the limited compute capability. And last but not least, on the uh, dependability uh, side of things, uh, ensuring continuous operation even in the wake of network outage is going to be a big challenge. And, and it's not only about network outage. In general, you can imagine uh, that users may be on 5G, they may be on 4G, on 3G, the network connectivity is not uniform across the globe. So how do we ensure that we provide good experience to the end customer? Now, unlike most of the talks where um, the core idea is presented without any insight into, into the application, here, uh, both Ira and I, we will walk the audience through what are the different use cases so that uh, the audience can walk away uh, with the core techniques and explore how they can apply in their respective domains. So in the next few slides, I'll walk through some of the use cases um, in the context of edge computing. So as illustrated on this slide, uh, there are several domains where uh, edge computing can play a vital role. Uh, for example, uh, autonomous vehicles, it can increase situational awareness, which essentially corresponds to uh, sharing uh, data around weather, about road conditions, uh, about uh, peer traffic. So uh, this can um, improve uh, the driving experience and also um, help mitigate um, uh, the number of accidents. So similarly, on the manufacturing side, uh, it can help with uh, uh, providing insights around predictive maintenance of turbines of motors and, and other uh, heavy uh, equipment. Uh, likewise, there are plenty of applications in the realm of telecommunications, retail, how do you do hyper-targeting and more in the real-time context. Let's say you are in downtown and there is a uh, concert going on. You know, uh, Can you be uh, recommended any discounted tickets given your location in real time? And of course, uh, the, uh, on a more personal basis, healthcare and life sciences uh, presents uh, a tremendous opportunity for edge computing. And given the uh, world we live in today, um, where we have uh, all been locked in in our homes due to COVID-19, uh, this is a great example of where edge computing can help. You know, how do we do remote health sensing to identify clusters of um, people who may be uh, asymptomatic or uh, they may be exp uh, exhibiting certain symptoms. Uh, likewise, how do we monitor the onset of a disease? How do we uh, detect anomalies in any lab uh, uh, test reports? So here uh, on the bottom right, I show one of the example anomaly reports from Anodot where uh, they applied um, uh, their product to detect a sharp increase in the number of uh, new cases uh, for one of the countries. Uh, continuing on the different use cases in different industries, um, we have energy and utilities. Agriculture uh, uh, is a tremendous opportunity. Today uh, around the globe, uh, a large percentage of the production uh, gets wasted uh, because of lack of insights around um, uh, uh, crop quality, about uh, insects, uh, about uh, water uh, availability, and so on and so forth. Uh, over the last decade and a half, data centers have grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, they constitute a uh, significant 
percentage of the energy consumption around the globe. So how can we make these data centers more efficient? Can we monitor uh, metrics like humidity, uh, airflow, um, and other data center metrics to improve their efficiency? In the realm of finance, we all know that most of the payments are done uh, on it, uh, digitally today, especially um, uh, in the uh, COVID-19 world. So how do we uh, make ourselves more robust against any potential fraud? Uh, we all may be making uh, payments through our phones. So can we have some sort of a uh, payment bot on our phones where it can detect any potential uh, fraudulent activity? Broadly speaking, uh, the use cases can be uh, categorized into three buckets, uh, more on the business side, on the people side, and the, uh, what we know, call it as Internet of Things. Now, either uh, you can have uh, interaction between self-interaction. Uh, for example, a business can have a self-interaction in the form of distributed business processing, or different domains can talk to each other or interact with uh, uh, each, uh, each other. For example, businesses uh, can have a more uh, immersive experience uh, with people via client content delivery. So how do we personalize that content uh, on the edge itself? Uh, likewise, you know, people may interact with things. How do we provide more immersive experience? And in, in that context, one of the key aspects is uh, around AR, VR. It's still a way out before it gets to the masses. But how do we personalize that experience um, uh, on the device itself? Uh, moving on, there is a, a plethora of, of use cases from uh, ranging from video analytics, from security, productivity. I just uh, talked about virtual reality. Like in a multiplayer game, how do we uh, tailor the game uh, uh, based on uh, how the different players are playing the game. Uh, so it's it's more dynamic instead of being static. Uh, in the augmented, augmented reality uh, realm, um, one can customize the shopping experience uh, on the device itself. Uh, and this will ensure that we are not limited to any connectivity issues um, which the uh, end user may experience. Uh, just to quickly wrap up uh, uh, the suite of use cases, uh, um, more closer to home, uh, smart homes provide a great opportunity. Um, how can we build intelligence on smart meters? How do we increase the uh, energy efficiency of our homes? Uh, smart uh, transportation, data reporting, uh, environmental monitoring presents another few use cases. Um, on the, again, this is more on the personal side, like how do we track air quality, water quality? And for, for instance, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was certain um, anxieties around, hey, is the water drinkable? You know, has, the, has that got uh, uh, contaminated? So conceivably, you know, we can uh, sprinkle uh, sensors in the water reservoir, and we can monitor the water quality in real time uh, at the edge itself. Uh, um, again, uh, more uh, uh, closer to, uh, to us, uh, privacy uh, is a big deal. Uh, so can we uh, support ideas like differential privacy on the device itself uh, so that while providing customized experience to the end user, uh, the privacy is not compromised. Automation uh, in the uh, realm of, uh, of um, in the industries, um, how do we uh, monitor the performance of, of robots, of drones? We talked about health and safety earlier. And then last but not least, conversational interfaces. Uh, Many of us have uh, gotten used to using CD or OK Google or, or uh, Cortana. How do we tailor these uh, digital assistants uh, by the respective use cases? So my use case can be different from Ira's use case. Can we uh, optimize the digital assistant uh, uh, 
um, on a per user basis on the device itself so that there is no information leakage from one device to, to, uh, to another. Uh, and more at a broader scale, uh, we have plenty of opportunities in the realm of smart cities around logistics, uh, insurance uh, is a, another big opportunity. My driving style and, um, and the number of miles I drive may significantly vary from how much uh, IRA drives um, out there in Israel. So uh, can we tailor the insurance policy based on our different driving styles? Uh, uh, so that we, uh, we pay uh, uh, accordingly. And even in, in an infrastructure context like railways, you know, um, uh, can we monitor the condition of the different uh, uh, railway cars and then uh, provide insights around uh, predictive maintenance? Uh, so one may, may so uh, so far we have talked about on more on the software side. So there are plenty of opportunities on the hardware side as well for the use cases. Um, uh, as per McKinsey, it's around a two hundred billion dollar market. Now what is interesting here is that you know uh, I would have expected that public sector or healthcare were uh, would have been at the top two of the uh, potential market, uh, but it turns out based on the research, travel and transport. Uh, uh, is at the top. Now, this is sort of cons uh, understandable because in the context of healthcare, we have uh, uh, regulations as, such as um, uh, HIPAA compliance in the public sector uh, and utilities context, uh, and there are challenges around regulation. So this will take a while uh, uh, to, to grow, but, uh, I'm, but we do expect uh, uh, these two segments to provide major opportunities for, for edge computing. So uh, moving, uh, uh, switching gears to more um, artificial intelligence that how, where does AI at the edge uh, uh, come in? So broadly speaking, there are three flavors. Either you can have uh, visual uh, response, you can have an auditory response, or you can have a tactile response. So here uh, in the, uh, one of the uh, uh, use cases is around, yeah, so um, uh, as I mentioned, like one of the uh, use cases is around facial recognition, uh, which can be used for authentication. And similarly, there are other um, uh, applications around vision, our AR, VR, language translation is big. Uh, so talking about language translation, there are different flavors. You, you can have text to speech, uh, which is commonly used, um, especially like, like uh, for uh, reading emails when you're driving. Uh, there can be other flavors where a text is converted into uh, acoustic features, then it's converted into, uh, into waveforms to analyze uh, uh, the text itself. Uh, the, um, there are several challenges in this regard, like the, the model you develop uh, for text-to-speech, for instance, has to be really small because the memory you have on your devices uh, is pretty limited. <laughs> also, um, as I mentioned uh, early in the talk, one of the key aspects is that how do you uh, provide insights in, in real time? So, so in, in that context, uh, uh, one has to make a space-time uh, trade-offs, uh, speed, accuracy trade-offs. Uh, and there are other challenges as mentioned on this slide, like you need to have a small, like devices have a small uh, warm, uh, form factor. They have to withstand uh, uh, rugged environments. So these does uh, have uh, uh, implications um, from a algo design perspective. So jumping the right into uh, the AI realm, uh, broadly speaking, you have either training workloads or you have inference workloads. Uh, training workloads are typically very compute heavy. So one has to design uh, robust algorithms uh, which uh, do not, which are not compute and memory uh, intensive. Uh, on the inference side, uh, there can be many metrics uh, uh, for prediction like velocity, orientation, trajectory, activity. Um, there are many uh, 
signals which which one can use either from the accelerometer gyroscope and so on and so forth so the, the main premise here is that the availability of data is huge the number of metrics you want to predict um uh, is also pretty uh, huge so um how do we um, uh, facilitate this so federated learning as i mentioned earlier is is one paradigm where we federate uh, uh, the infrared training across different devices to make this happen so uh, on the federated learning side we have a uh, we have a uh, wide suite of applications like mobile keyboard vocal classifiers and so on and so forth um the challenges are, um as i mentioned earlier is owing to limited compute and memory on the devices uh, convergence time uh, can be a potential issue and then if you are leveraging federated learning then communication between devices can be a challenge uh so uh, uh, uh given the challenges uh, uh to quickly uh, brush through uh, we have um, one way to design algorithms is that they need to be one pass uh, so that they are fast um uh, the uh, the the other flavor is that the algorithms have to be incremental in nature uh, uh, so that um, we can meet the real time constraints Uh, so so in the uh, uh, incremental uh, context uh, there may be challenges around numerical stability how do you build incremental al algorithms when you have a, a wide set of signals so then essentially you have a data in a high dimensional space so uh, that may be a big challenge in itself so so far we have talked about the use cases about the applications now everything rests on the data the incoming data being of high fidelity you know otherwise as uh, most of you in the audience may have heard you know uh, it may be a case of garbage in garbage out now uh, data fidelity is especially a big challenge in the context of um, edge devices uh, because as i mentioned uh, these devices uh, have to withstand a, a rugged environment they may be connectivity issues so you you may be, you may bump into uh, issues like missing data or you can have anomalies in the data and that's where anomaly detection can, uh, comes into play in the context of uh, uh, edge computing now you may wonder that uh, hey you know what's new in this this uh, anomaly detection has been st studied for over 125 years so uh, what is and here this slide essentially highlights some of the techniques which uh, of flavors of techniques which have been uh used in wide variety of context um outside of uh, edge computing now these techniques are typically not viable um because uh, of concept drift you know the underlying distribution may change you know which because of you know uh, your your connected your connectivity dropping uh, in real time due to variety of data you can have communication bottleneck between devices and of course most importantly the algorithms which was which have been proposed over the last 100 years didn't have any real time constraints uh in mind so one of the common ways to develop these techniques is called sketching so um, there are different flavors of sketching depending on the application some of these are listed here on the web on the slide so uh, ira will uh, will uh, walk you through some of these uh techniques uh, uh, in a couple of minutes so uh, in the context of privacy and security there are techniques which have been proposed more recently to provide tamper proof resistance so tampering can be think can be thought of as a anomaly in the data so that's another use case for, for uh, anomaly detection at the edge so these are some of the algorithm algorithms which have been proposed specifically for anomaly detection at the edge these are broad, essentially variants of techniques which have been in use uh, for a while but they have been sort of uh, slice and dice to make it fit on the devices uh, because of low memory and how to make them run faster on the devices due to low compute so now i will hand hand over to ira to walk us through some concrete use cases um, uh, based on his interaction uh, with the customers of anadot so thank you arun uh, and 
to introduce myself again, I'm Yura Cohen. I'm the chief data scientist of Anadoc, and we're a company that developed a product that does anomaly detection, both as a service and also uh, potentially at the edge. So I'm going to talk about a few of these uh, use cases right now. So first, I'm very happy to be at this, uh, at this virtual conference. Uh, first, I didn't have to travel far. I didn't have to shave. Uh, but I have to wear my reading glasses in order to see uh, my laptop screen, because if I look at the big screen, it looks like I'm looking somewhere else. Um, so I hope it's not weird for you uh, listening to this talk. So let me talk about Anodot's uh, anomaly detection and how do we do anomaly detection. And we do it uh, basically in a sequential manner, uh, not just because of edge, edge anomaly detection cases, but even when you want to scale non-edge case uh, to millions and billions of time series, uh, doing it using non-sequential algorithms is, is very expensive computationally. And then the benefit of the anomalies uh, uh, is smaller than the, the cost of running that platform. Um, so you have to weigh those in as well. The way we do it is we collect the data uh, continuously as a streaming uh, service and analyze uh, all the data on the stream itself to detect uh, to, to learn the normal patterns. And then uh, uh, based on those learn normal patterns, we can detect anomalies whenever they arrive. Uh, these models of learning normal behaviors have to keep getting updated sequentially. Uh, so any algorithm that you take, you have to adapt it to be sequential if it's not uh, designed that way from, from, from the beginning. Otherwise, it, it's very hard to scale this out. Now, another important point that is both important at the edge, but, in the, but even more critical at the non-edge cases, uh, you want to correlate the anomalies. So suppose you have a host of sensors and uh, you, you can detect their anomalies on the edge. That can be done very fast. You still want to be able to correlate them into a concise story uh, to tell you all the anomalies that occur that are related to each other because those, those correlations often lead to uh, an actionable insight. And then uh, the algorithms can, uh, can, provide, can, can get feedback if it's available uh, and improve themselves. So this is how it looks like, uh, sequential updating of the models and learning uh, one particular time series as time goes on. In this case, you see on the left when the time series, you have very few samples. Your normal pattern is very, uh, very uh, wide or the baseline is very wide, which means the pattern is not learned well yet. But as time goes on, uh, the algorithm should adapt themselves and detect more and more, uh, get more and more information about the time series. And in this case, it first detects that there is a daily pattern and then applies it to the model. And then it detects that there is a weekly pattern and then applies it to the model. And uh, at the end, you get a very tight baseline, which is the output of that machine learning model that learns the normal behavior the visual output of it. And uh, the thing is, and especially when we're talking about sensors from multiple sources, and uh, you can get a lot of different behaviors of time series. So there isn't really a single model that fits them all. And Arun listed several different models. And I can tell you, some of them work on some data. Some of them work better on other data. Uh, we have found that the right approach is an ensembling of models. Uh, fitting the right model to the right uh, behavior of the data or ensembling multiple models together in some cases. And these are real examples uh, of, of both time series and anomalies that our system uh, detected, uh, which actually have very different behaviors and require different algorithms to learn their normal patterns. Now, the correlation helps, helps in two regards. First, it helps understand uh, what happened and then where it happened, because you might have a lot of sensors firing uh, ver uh, various uh, anomalies. And the correlation themselves, assuming that some of them uh, uh, are not just symptoms, but are also uh, indicative of root causes, they can help understand the root cause much faster. And that's really the, another aspect that is very important, which is typically more expensive computationally, which means if you do it at the edge, you actually do need to um, make your algorithms much faster. Now, anomaly detection by itself uh, is meaningless unless you inform somebody uh, that uh, the anomaly happened. And once you start informing the alerts, uh, the notion of false positives becomes very, very critical to minimize. And uh, a lot of the minimization is done 
first of all, by applying the right algorithm to the right data, to the, to the data so it can capture as accurately as possible its normal patterns. Uh, but that we have found that, that that by itself is not enough because not every anomaly is created equal. Uh, not every anomaly is interesting as another. So uh, we baked into our product and we believe that, that these kind of things have to be baked into any type of product that does alerting, uh, various filtering mechanisms that allow the user uh, or, or the system to automatically discard some anomalies as not interesting and send only the right alerts. So it starts from scoring anomalies, giving various parameters and optimize uh, the duration of the anomaly, their delta, uh, allowing the users to see simulations of past anomalies so they can uh, um, do things with a filter, filter uh, based on that, and add influencing factors that help you filter anomalies or decide whether they're important or not. And that lets you uh, add context and correlation. And at the end of the day, if, you can, if the users can provide also feedback for alerts, in the form of this was good or bad, it can loop back and in semi-supervised fashion, improve uh, the, the naturally unsupervised algorithms that are used in anomaly detection. So with all of these, basically, uh, um, we've, we have a product that is being widely used by a lot of different companies in various different uh, industries and use cases. And the reason they can use it is because we really baked into the product a lot of different algorithms for capturing many types of behaviors and the focus on, on false positives. So all of this is nice. Uh, these are the main use cases that people use us today for revenue and cost monitoring, partner monitoring, customer experience monitoring. But what does this have to do with the edge? You must be, you must be asking yourself. So let's talk about uh, edge use cases as well. And I think in the context of uh, COVID-19, it actually is pushing it quite significant, quite fast along uh, in, in a variety of ways. Um, the first way is uh, monitoring health. Moni uh, so remote monitoring of health is not new. It's been talked about for a long time. In, in this day and age, COVID-19, it's actually pushing it quite significantly. And here you have watches that can measure a lot of things about your health and detect whether something becomes anomalous, either a sleep pattern or, or blood oxygen or anything like that, whether you're sick or not. And especially if you are uh, a carrier of COVID-19, you might not want to go out to anywhere and you might want your device to, be, to inform the, your doctor that they should call you to see whether you need to go to the hospital or not. In the hospitals themselves, uh, uh, COVID-19 actually presented a new type of uh, issue, especially in ICUs where it's dangerous for the doctors and nurses to be present in, uh, in close proximity to the patients that they have to take care of. Normal ICU, you have, you have a lot of staff for each patient. Uh, it depends on the geography, but typically at least one staff member for a patient, one or two patients. Uh, in COVID-19 first, uh, some hospitals in some regions saw an overload of patients in ICU. And the doctors and nurses, should their time with inside the ICU next to the patient should be minimized to only the cases where they're absolutely needed. So that lends itself quite nicely to um, uh, edge cases. Uh, and I'm going to talk about monitoring uh, patients, actually, um, at volume, which is the case of a pandemic. So you want to monitor patients at home, you want to monitor them in a hospital when they're ventilated or, and when they're not. And the problem is the, the existing techniques in, in healthcare for alerting on uh, deterioration of patients is actually quite lacking. It's well known, it was known even before, but, in, uh, but here it actually exposed it a lot more. For example, blood oxygen, if you're ventilated, if it goes below 90%, all alarms bells will go off. But when it reaches that, you might have missed the deterioration that happened for a few hours or days from the... Uh, um, from, from, the, from the patient. And at that point, it's already, it might be already be too late. Now, the other side of it is that a lot of these static thresholds built into the devices are uh, generating many, many alerts. We see it in the IT space. Anybody working in IT systems knows they get a lot of false positives. It turns out in ICUs and in healthcare, it's the same because while specific thresholds and specific parameters might be correct, uh, they, they oftentimes lead to too many uh, alerts and alert fatigue by patients. The requirement is remote monitoring, early warning score, 
to identify deterrent conditions and minimizing uh, false positives. So just like uh, the business use case. So let's look at some of these uh, examples. So this is an example of a real of, of data from a, from a watch. Uh, it's looking at respiratory rate, which is important in the COVID case. Uh, it's been shown that uh, uh, deviations in respiratory rates actually uh, indicate deterioration of, uh, of disease sometimes. Uh, so if you, the problem is each person has their own respiratory rate that is normal and might even change throughout the day and at night. So you have to adjust uh, the model to the data of that particular person. You cannot assume some static thresholds here. So this is an example of an anomaly of a, a respiratory rate that went down for one person being monitored. Uh, this is an example from an ICU patient looking at, and here the correlation comes into play, looking at multiple parameters being monitored uh, through, these, uh, uh, through the monitoring of an ICU patient, sending it, uh, looking at the device itself, finding the anomalies and sending that information to the uh, NOC or the patient. Uh, uh, a lot of hospitals just created an outside uh, uh, room where they can observe these vitals but also get alerted and again when there is a lot of patients this has to be uh, the, the alerts are really critical because there isn't an eyeball looking at every single patient and their health and their health uh, situation right now and a lot of times they miss deterioration as we see in this anomaly here um, now, showing what we learned is that showing graphs to, to doctors and nurses uh, like that, oftentimes they don't know how to interpret them, looking at graphs over time. Um, the, the right way to show is to give some score, and there's been a lot of work, especially in the last few months, uh, trying to provide an early warning score for deterioration of the ICU patient. And these scores that you see here is actually for a patient over a 20, 36 hour period. Um, where the score goes up to, uh, you know, anything about seven, above seven is already critical. Uh, and what the doctor can see at any given time is what is the score of the patient uh, from zero to any number above seven, based on all the anomalies that were detected in the vital signs of that patient. So what are the benefits? Early detection. Uh, so you improve outcomes, the system is constantly monitoring, you, you can scale it, so you reduce the load on the medical staff uh, by using this type of autonomous monitoring or machine learning based approach, and you reduce this, the risk to, to the staff. And you actually, when you monitor people at home, you also reduce the risk of them going out and infecting other people. So this is quite, quite beneficial and uh, we're working on that. So yeah, so uh, with this, uh, we'll, we've come to the end of the talk and uh, we've gone a long way uh, as the slide here writes from, you know, the, the, the engines to edge computing and being able to actually run these machine learning, machine learning models on edge computing. And we see the benefits of these edge computing use cases. And, and as, I, as I demonstrated here in the notion of a pandemic, these benefits become even more important for keeping everybody safe. So uh, thank you very much. And I think now we can take uh, questions and, uh, and I'll go shave afterwards. <laughs>